So today, on the auspicious occasion of Narsi Chaturdashi, I'll discuss broadly on the topic of appreciating Lord Narsimha Dev's mood and form through contrast. So we'll be contrasting the form of Narsimha Dev with the form of Krishna and the form of Vishwarupa. So Nar Narsimha Chaturdashi is the occasion when Lord Narsimha Dev appeared on this earth millennia ago. Let's begin with a verse which describes the form of Lord Narsimha Dev. If at any time I am not audible, please uh, message me and uh, we'll adjust. So this is from the prayers offered by Srila Prahlad Maharaj in the seventh canto in the ninth chapter. Naham bibhemya jitate ati bhayan kasya jivarka netra bhrukuti rabaso gridam strat antras rajak shatajakesh rashanku karanan nirad bhita digibhad aribin nakhagrat. So here, let's try to visualize the scene where this is all happening. This is the palace of of Hiranyakashipu in the courtyard. The backstory is that Hiranyakashipu has conquered the whole universe and has been reigning supreme, unchallenged. And yet there is one person who refused to submit to him, and that was Prahalad. And he Hiranyakashipu got so angry that he repeatedly tried to chastise and then even assassinate Prahlad. But none, nothing succeeded. And then finally, Prahlad was confronted by his father. And he asked, is, you say this Vishnu is everywhere. Is he in this pillar also? He said, yes, of course. And when he smashed the pillar, from that emerged the huge form of Narasimha Dev. And then there was a fierce fight. Actually, it was Hiranyakashipu who fought fiercely. Narasimha Dev was nonchalant. As the Bhagavatam described like a cat play, play, playing with a mouse. And now finally, Hiranyakashipu has been killed. So still Lord Narasimha Dev is angry. And the entire assembly of devatas has appeared over there. In the previous chapter, the various devatas, Brahma, Shiva, Ganesh, Indra, Chandra, Varuna, Vayu, all of these have offered prayers, but they have failed to pacify the Lord. And then finally, Prahalad comes forward. In fact, the devatas sent Prahalad forward. And Prahlad offers prayers. And that same Lord Narasimha Dev, who was roaring so fiercely that everybody's blood was curdling, that even a ferocious demon like Hiranyakashipu felt so scared that he closed his eyes in fear. Prahlad appeared fearlessly in front of that Lord. And the Lord became very peaceful and gentle, touched his hand on Prahlad's head blessed him and Prahlad offered prayers. Prahlad offered prostrated obeisance and the Lord picked him up. So we can visualize Lord Narasimha Dev sitting on a throne and Prahlad is offering prayers in front of him, very close to him. Generally on the, nurse, on the altar when we have, we have a picture of Narasimha Dev and Hiranyakashipu being, uh, being delivered and Prahlad all together. But these are chronologically distinct incidents. So right now, Narasimha Dev is seated on the throne and Prahalad is offering prayers. And what is the mood over there? The, 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 the Asura, the world, uh, universe terrorizing Asura has been killed. His associates have also been killed. But still, even the Devatas are fearful. So the atmosphere of fear is still there. Because three reasons. First is, even the Devatas have never seen a form like Hiranyakashipu. So, or like, like Narasimha Dev. They understand that this is Vishnu, but he looks nothing like Vishnu. 
he looks scary he looks like a giant lion so just the form is unfamiliar and scary on top of that his mood is was still angry till a few moments ago and although that anger seems to have decreased but that is decreased primarily in interaction with uh, with prahlad but still the other devatas are fearful so it's just like you know if somebody is in office and the boss is very angry and all the employees are fearful is the boss going to yell at me is the boss going to speak something harsh to me and suddenly maybe the maybe somebody from the boss family the boss son calls and the boss tone and mood may entirely change and the boss may talk very sweetly okay so how are you okay yeah i'll come and pick you up take care and now the boss is talking very cordially sweetly with the son but is he going to talk similarly with everyone else that fear is still there so this is not the fear that we will be destroyed there are different kinds of fear also there is the fear where if we are in the present if we know that there are violent terrorists or violent invaders that fear is a fear that we may be destroyed we may be killed so that is a fear of our life or our well being itself but there is another kind of fear when we are in the presence of someone who we know is our well wisher but we are afraid that we may have knowingly or unknowingly done something that may have displeased that person so that fear is a different category of fear the bhagavatam talks about how the whole universe works under the fear of the lord mad bhaya dwati vatoyam so that is a healthy fear but whether there is a healthy fear or unhealthy fear prahlad's words begin by addressing that atmosphere of course this is not the first verse that he is speaking he has spoken before but the earlier verses that he has spoken before this are primarily talking about how he although unqualified personally he says i have no devotion and in this galaxy of illustrious people i have no qualification still how is it that i am able to speak he says i am speaking because it's your mercy and i'm speaking because glorifying you is for my purification so he's speaking these two things and then he starts addressing the atmosphere over there and one of the uh, verses he speaks is first he has previously pre- the previous verse he has spoken that my dear lord your form is always auspicious now it's in terms of the atmosphere over there it's a jarring contrast oh, how is it auspicious so he saying naham bibhemya i am not afraid ajit te you o lord are unconquerable ajit so that lord who can never be defeated by anyone ati bhayanakasya so bhayanak is fearsome ati is a prefix which acts as a intensifier extremely fearsome ati bhaya nakasya jivark netra brukuti rabaso gridam strat in general in writing it is said don't tell me show me so for example instead of saying if we are writing a novel or a, we are describing an incident oh he was very angry you can say that okay the, his eyes turned red you could see the nerves swelling in his neck or the nerves swelling in his forehead we could could hear almost hear him gritting his teeth i could see that his fists were clenched so this description gives us a vivid mental picture and then we ourselves understand you don't even have to say that he was angry i understand he was angry so he's saying ati bhayanaka he was fearsome so how was he fearsome he is describing jiva the tongue now the tongue was lashing out of the mouth like a sword so that is described by the acharya's commentaries and other places narsimha leela is described in the bhagavatam as well as in other purana like the narsimha purana so his sword had been lashing out earlier now of course it was peaceful but it had also been like a sword then ark netra so netra is eyes ark often refers to the sun so his eyes were blazing 
and blazing like not the rising sun or the setting sun it is like the full afternoon sun is very difficult to see so his eyes were fierce fiery brukuti rabhaso gradam istrat so brukuti means it's one thing to have red eyes which indicate anger but on top of that if somebody is frowning frowning and scowling and glaring and that unnerves us so brukuti rabhas ogra damstrat and then ogra ogra is fearsome it is fiery scary again so there is some amount of repetition of describers or uh, repetition of similar describers bhayanakasya and ogra damstrat damstra refers to teeth so he is in a leonine form a lion form so naturally he has his uh, in his jaws he has his teeth which are fierce which can rip apart the prey the prey that he is going to devour so antra sraja and then he is actually wearing a garland antra is intestine the inner organs sraja so he is wearing a garland of intestines and among many things now when we think about it it can now we know lord narasimha dev is all attractive but actually speaking it is quite it is quite gruesome to think about this that somebody might wear a garland of intestine so blood is dripping from an antra sraja kshata jakeshara so his hair is is his mane is the the hair on the head for lion lions is called mane so the main it's on a, the main is also fierce it is described that his form was so tall that when he shook his head in anger the clouds got scattered so his body and especially his hair is sprinkled with blood chanku karanan and anger seems to be pervading his entire form so his ears also seem to be erect straight high that also indicates his fury and then nirad bhit digibhad so bibhemya is fear i am not fearful you said but that same mood bhit he comes again and nirad nirad is his roar bhit digibhad so he is saying the roar was so great his roar was so fearsome digibhad arbin nakhagrat the giant elephants who sustain the universe they are trembling so sometimes when the noise is, noise is very loud we may say it was a ear splitting sound what does that mean normally the ears hear the sound and they receive and process the sound but if it is a very loud sound we feel as if our eardrums the tympanic membrane are getting split by that so here is describing that is not just a ear splitting sound it is like a universe splitting sound the beings which sustain the universe they are shaking and trembling it appears as if they are going to uh, they, they are going to collapse in fear so such is his is fear some form now the word aw is often used to indicate a feeling of of being impressed when we see something huge there is the feeling of aw that comes because of that now there are two words there is awesome and there is awful so general so all of the the aw word is in both awful means terrible and awesome means wonderful so the lord's form fills one with awe but what kind of awe is it for the demons it is awful for the devotees it is awesome of course nowadays the word awesome has become a typical teenagerish word where they use it for everything if something is delicious it will be awesome if something is um, is uh, is beautiful it's awesome so but awesome generally means not just excellent it means something which is so huge so impressive so gigantic that it fills us with awe 
so this is the form of the lord that narsim that is manifested by narsimha dev now of course when prahlad is describing this form he is not describing the form that he is seeing right now because this form is very gentle it is not roaring but prahlad is describing that my dear lord not only am i not afraid of you in the form which i am seeing right now earlier i saw you in action in a fierce form but i am not afraid of you even in that form generally in the bhagavatam when prayers are offered the prayers are uh, they serve three purposes glorification purification instruction so they they the prayers are primarily meant for the glorification of the lord the prayers are also meant for the purification of whoever is offering the prayers and the prayers are also meant for the instruction of everyone so in one sense prahlad by his example is telling everyone don't be afraid he says i am not afraid so there's no reason for all of you to be afraid also na ham bibhemya so this is the extraordinary form of the lord now let's look at what is going on with this form by contrasting it with other forms so here we have the form of narsimha dev who is ripping apart the intestine of of hiranyakashipu and here we have the form of krishna so let's try to contrast narsimha dev forms form with krishna's form and then we will try to draw some inferences from that now, i have already described narsimha dev's form so i won't go into the detailed description of all of it but let's look at some features so the, the form of narsimha dev generally when we look at someone we may look at their height we may look at their if we are directly looking at their face the first thing we usually look at them is their mouth or their eyes that's where the emotion comes out most prominently in the face so as i mentioned the eyes of narsimha dev are they are frowning and glaring as if he will be burning something with his eyes everything with his eyes in fact so if we consider krishna what are the uh, nature of krishna's eyes sundara kundal nayan vishala and his eyes are very large and beautiful they are like arvind dala yataksham they are large and beautiful eyes they are filled with love so the eyes are we could say radically different one is radiating anger the other is radiating love and then from his his mouth see there is damsh uh, damshtrat there is a ugra damshtrat he is fierce teeth and nirad beat digibad blood curdling roars but as far as krishna is concerned what is it prahasitam priya prema vikshanam prahasitam priya he is smiling gently mandaha samuditan nambujam so krishna he is smiling gently and then not only is his smile gentle when he speaks madhuraya gira valgu vakyaya so he his voice is melodious and the words that he speaks are sweet are soft are loving so all three attributes the expression which is conveyed through the mouth and the lips the 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 overall tone of the voice and the words spoken through it all of them are very very sweet again a dramatic antipodal contrast now if we look at the garland as i mentioned antra sraja is wearing blood stained intestines as a garland if we contrast that with krishna what do we have gale sohe vaijayan dimala he wears a flow a garland of flowers beautiful flowers which are which are both their beauty is in their form as well as in their fragrance and again a very big contrast so when narsimha dev wears this garland what is the idea of wearing the garland 
it's like a victory trophy and okay this person was defeated and now that person has been destroyed of course uh, in the gaudiya tradition there is there is the description that this garland although it was it was scary to have intestines but it also enhances his beauty i'll come to that a little later now if you look at his hands narsimha dev as you see has many hands and his hands have nails and the nails what is the power that they have they can rip apart the enemy's bodies and in fact with, with respect to hiranyakashipu it's described his body was harder than that harder than mountains indra's thunderbolt could crush mountains but that same thunderbolt could not even scratch hiranyakashipu's body and that was r- ripped apart by uh, narsimha dev's nails so generally on the altar narsimha dev is depicted with the <clears throat> which uh, with the vishnu abharanas with the weapons of lord vishnu but it is described in the fighting lord narsimha dev did not use any weapons he just simply uses nails as his weapons now as far as krishna is concerned especially krishna in vrindavan what happens is his hand is soft and gentle and when he touches devotees with his hands you know he may embrace them just as when when uh, akrura came to meet krishna when krishna saw him krishna offered respects and embraced him and all the agony that he was feeling the apprehension of having come to come as krishna uh, as a representative of krishna's enemy it all just disappeared the gopis they also pray that shri karagraham that your hand is the abode of the goddess of fortune and they say that please place that hand on our head and bless us with that so it's a soft and gentle hand if you consider the size as i said that the size was huge in this particular form it is that the lord size was actually far greater than the size of his opponents if you consider lord ram was facing demons like ravan or ravan's associates like kumbhakarna or atikaya or mahakaya the demons were huge and lord ram was small mm-hmm. but in this case hiranyakashipu was a huge demon but narasimha dev Uh, completely dwarfed him. The same day was huge. So, in contrast, Krishna's Krishna's size is life-like, human-like size. It's approachable. So, generally, if somebody is very formidable in terms of not just appearance but their their size, their form, that also intimidates us. But there's so if the size is approach uh, is approachable, then size itself it's also different. It's approachability. So we can see. that there is such a huge difference in the forms of narsimha dev and krishna advaitam achyutam anadi mananta roopam the brahma samhita says advaitam that one ultimate reality is advaita there is no duality in that reality it's one ultimate reality but at the same time ananta roopam there are unlimited forms and not just unlimited forms here we see the forms are so different so radically opposite so why why are the forms so different here we see that same narasimha dev is in a form which is very sweet and loving here he's he is we'll see smiling and he's blessing prahlad by touching his hand later on prahlad will say my dear lord this blessing that you have offered me by touching me on my head this is so rare that even the devtas aspire for it and don't get it i am greatly blessed by you but this is later but when he was in a fearsome form he, he was looking very different so the same person can manifest different forms depending on the purpose so krishna's purpose is different so if we consider in terms of purpose 
what are the what is the purpose of krishna in vrindavan the, the, that per, that manifestation of the lord has a purpose simply of reciprocating love with his devotees even when krishna does something superhuman supernatural like say lifting govardhan hmm? uh, now that is something which no human being can do but if we see the vaishnava acharyas or for that matter even the bhagavatam itself it does not spend too much space too many verses how amazing is it that krishna lifted govardhan rather okay krishna lifted govardhan what did he do after that after that he was reciprocating love with his devotees now, how he spoke with ibadar yashoda how when how he reciprocated love with madhumangal and they had mischievous uh, interactions and how when, when radharani glanced at him with love that krishna who was not shaken by the weight of govardhan you know, he was he was shaken by the weight of radharani's affection and the govardhan trembled a little bit at that time because so there the focus is on reciprocating love so in one sense in vrindavan the even when the demons come bal kridana kam eva it is just like a child's play he deals with the demons so krishna's form is very affectionate and love filled that's his purpose of reciprocating love now when narsimha dev manifested this furious form in hiranyakashipu's court what was the purpose it was twofold hmm to destroy those who had attacked his devotee here it is prahlad now primarily it was prahlad who was the devotee and prahlad had at his it is described that by his association many of the his co students in the gurukul of shanda and amarka had also become devotees but their devotion was nowhere near prahlad's and that's why when they had seen that prahlad was being persecuted they all had concealed their devotion you know we don't want a fate like that so they were also devotees but their their devotee devotion was tender was nascent so he narsimha dev was furious with the with hiranyakashipu and all those who had assisted hiranyakashipu in persecuting prahlad but then the question comes up after hiranyakashipu was killed after hiranyakashipu's associates who tried to assist hiranyakashipu in attacking narsimha dev were killed why was lord narsimha dev still angry why was narsimha dev not pacified by the prayers of the devdas that is the second part that he was saying all of you he didn't say those words but that was his mood implied mood he says all of you are powerful administrators of the universe you saw how my devotee was being persecuted and you did nothing you didn't protect my devotee not only did you not protect you didn't even protest so you did nothing when the time for action was there and now you are offering sweet prayers i don't care for these prayers so narsimha dev's anger was not just towards the asuras but was even towards the devtas who had failed to protect his devotee of course from another perspective we can say that the devtas couldn't have done anything at all because narsimha dev because narsimha dev alone could have stopped ranikashi but even discreetly nobody had supported prahlad at that time so narsimha dev was angry about that so his anger continued it is only when prahlad came forward at that time he became pacified so the narsimha dev's anger was serving a particular purpose so the lord is one but depending on the purpose that he is uh, he is fulfilling he manifests the not just the appropriate mood but even the appropriate form yad yad dhiya to urugaya vibhavayanti tat tad vapu praniyase sadanugrahaya so the lord manifests the form appropriate to the mood there is described according the mood of the devotee so narsimha dev manifested a form which would fulfill the promise of brahma ji 
at Narasimha, that Hiranyakashipu could not be killed by any being created by Brahma. So he manifested a form which was complete. Advaitam, he says, Adrishtapurvam. It was something which had never been seen before. So now, his, his anger was there. So earlier I said that Narasimha Dev's form is fear, is fiery. It's filled with anger. And Krishna's form is radiating love. But although Lord Narasimha Dev is manifesting anger, it is not that he is unloving. Even the anger is an expression of love. That's why in bhakti, in the bhakti tradition, what happens is that the entire gamut of human emotions are engaged. Hmm. Even anger, which is normally considered an, uh, an emotion which is to be given up, Trividham Narakasyedam, Krishna says, Dwaram Nashinam Atmana, Kama Kodasatha Lobas. So Kama is considered to be undesirable, but even anger can be used in the Lord's service. So, and the Lord can use this in his devotee's service. So, when does anger express love? When we are punishing those who threaten one's object of love. Uh, so that is the Lord wants to punish the demons and then also when warning those who fail to protect one's objects of love. So in both these ways, he's actually expressing his anger and in expressing his anger, he is uh, expressing his love through his anger. So now let's look at, uh, compare his form with another form and that is the form of Vishwarupa. Vishwarupa is the form of Krishna as manifested in the in the course of speaking the Bhagavad Gita on the Kurukshetra battlefield. Now we will see that there are some uh, some significant similarities in the form that the Lord manifests in Kurukshetra and the Lord manifests here in uh, in Hirakarikanikashipu's court. So let's look at the form. So here we will see that there are many eyes which are described. Uh, um, the, there is is described that there is there's many many faces, many many eyes and now these eyes we will see that these are none of them are are very pleasing. Of course, it is not that all of them are furious. Uh, when we talk about the Vishwarupa, also, what happens is uh, there is a gradual progression in the revelation of the Vishwarupa. Also, initially, when Arjuna sees the Vishwarupa, what he sees is actually there is he's vismay vismitosmi. He says, I'm astonished. So initially, it's such a magnificent display that he's astounded by it. But from the vismay, there is pravitita manome. He says, I'm disturbed. I'm I am anguished. I am fearful. He says, I am fearful. So what happens is, when Krishna shows initially the Vishwarupa, that is astounding. But within the Vishwarupa, Krishna also shows the Kala Rupa. And that Kala Rupa is scary. In fact, we'll see in the development of the 11th chapter, initially when Arjuna sees the Vishwarupa, he identifies it. He says, Pashami Vishweshwara Vishwarupa. He says in 11.16 in the Bhagavad Gita. But then, now, now he has heard about the Vishwarupa, how the whole universe is contained in the form of the Lord. Everything within the universe is seen in the form of the Lord. And he's seeing that. But then suddenly he starts seeing something very scary. And that's why in the 31st verse, he asks, 31st, the 31st, uh, verse, he starts asking that, Akya himeko bhavanu grarupo. Who are you? Who are you? In Sanskrit, there is a first person reference, sorry, second person references of different kinds. Like in, uh, in English, second person reference is just you. Mm, but in say, like in Hindi, we have tu or aap. Tu is a normal reference, aap is a more uh, respectful second person reference. 
So in Sanskrit also we have Twam and we have Bhavan. So Twam is a general second person reference. Bhavan is a respectful second person reference. So, so what happens is when Arjuna is surrendering to Krishna in the start of the Gita in 2.7, he says, Pruchamitvam. He says, I, 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 Pruchamitvam dharma sammudha cheta. He says, please tell me what is dharma. Please tell me what is the right thing to do. So there, yes, he is surrendering to Krishna, but Krishna is his friend, Sakai. But when he sees the Vishwarupa, that Twam changes to Bhavan. Akhya himeko Bhavanu Grarupo Bhavan. So it's like, say, we pick up the phone. So, Kone tu? Who is speaking? And we find out it's, a, some, it's our boss speaking. Oh, main aapke liye kya kar sakta what can I do for you? So the mood changes. So Arjuna, when he sees this universal form, he's scared. Bhavan, he says. Ba, he's much more respectful. But still, we may say, why is he asking, who are you? Hasn't he already identified? He says, you're the Vishwarupa. But what happens is there is something different over here. Say we are going for a walk with an old friend whom we are meeting after a decade or so. And then we are chatting with them nicely. And suddenly a group of thugs pounce on us. Now when that group of thugs pounce on us, at that time, our friend suddenly starts manifesting extraordinary martial skills, you know, karate or judo or whatever. And that all those thugs are knocked down within a few minutes. And then we may turn at our friend and say, who are you? Now, in one sense, we know he is our friend. But when we see something unfamiliar in someone familiar, then we ask, who are you? So, who are you? What have you done to my friend? Where has my friend gone? What is this new thing I'm seeing? So similarly, Arjuna knows this is Vishwarupa, but the Vishwarupa simply shows the whole universe contained in, in the body of the Lord. But when Arjuna is seeing this fearsome sight, he's seeing all the warriors going into the mouth of the Vishwarupa. He says, what is this? I don't know what this is. That's why he's asking, who are you? So that unfamiliar feature is the Kala Rupa. That unfamiliar feature which Krishna is showing is the Kala Rupa. So what happens with respect to the Kala Rupa is that the Kala Rupa is, is devouring everyone. So it's, it's fire coming out from his mouth and it's devouring almost everyone in the battlefield. Rute pitvam na bhavishyanti sarve. Krishna tells Arjuna that, that except for you Pandavas, everybody will be destroyed. So just as the Narasimha Rupa is fierce, the Vishwarupa is, especially the Kala dimension of the Vishwarupa is also fierce. Now there are garlands, there are garlands which are uh, many, many, there are many bodies, many faces and many necks and many garlands over there on his body. Then if you consider the hands, again we said that uh, here also the Vishwarupa seems to have many, many hands. Aneka bahudar vaktranetram. And there are many, many weapons, many, many ornaments in each of these arms. So it's so scary, it's an awesome form. And Nabhas Prisham Deepta Mananta Varanam Anek Varanam. So Nabhas Prisham. This form is that it's everywhere. Later on, then when Arjuna wants to offer obeisances, he says, if you go to a temple, the altar is in front and we offer obeisances. He says, My dear Lord, this Vishwarupa is everywhere. So where do I offer obeisances? So he says, that, okay, I'll offer obeisances from Nama Purastha Data Prishta Taste Namostute Sarvata Eva Sarva I offer obeisances from the front, I offer obeisances from behind, I offer obeisances from all directions to you. I, Namo Namaste to Sahasra Kutva Hundreds and thousands of times I offer obeisances. So all pervading for. So we will see here that there are remarkable similarities between the Narsimha Rupa and the Vishwarupa, specifically the Kala dimension of the Vishwarupa. So why is there such similarity over here? Because the purposes are similar. So Krishna and Rindavan has a different purpose. Krishna when revealing the Vishwarupa and the Kala Rupa has a different purpose. So Narsimha Rupa, as I said, is, it was to punish the wrongdoers. And to warn those who didn't stop the wrongdoers. Now, Vishwarupa, what was the purpose? 
it is to reveal the fate awaiting the wrong doers so what has happened is arjuna had simply asked krishna please show me the vishwarupa but krishna said i will show you something extra and what was that extra krishna showed see arjuna's concern was should i if i don't fight then can i avoid the death of my relatives can i avoid this terrible war in which so many people will be killed krishna is revealing through the kala rupa darshan that actually their death is destined your arrows will simply be the instruments for their death it is their own past karma which is going to cause their death to nimitta matram bhava sauvya sachi krishna tells arjuna in 1133 you can be an instrument if you don't choose to be an instrument i will act they will have to get their karma their destiny is going to befall them the only choice is whether you will take responsibility and you will get the glory so krishna reveals the vishwarupa here it is not to terrify arjuna although arjuna does get terrified momentarily but it that terrifying vision is to solidify arjuna's determination yes let me do my duty so to reveal the fate awaiting the wrong doers and the fate awaiting those who are supporting the wrong doers also so in that sense fear is serving krishna's purpose Uh, so arjuna has to understand that what is happening here is not simply my my decision and my intention i am a part of something far bigger than myself and i can play my part in that plan so thus the vishwarupa's form is very similar to narasimha rupa's form so now to conclude in the last few minutes how does all this be a relevance to us one of the defining understandings of the bhakti tradition is that god just doesn't doesn't just exist up there somewhere far away god exists in here within us and without us the vishwa is also a form of the lord the events that happen in the world are also in one sense not disconnected from the lord so the events that happen in our life some of the events may seem good they may seem benevolent and some of the events may seem malevolent but they are both orchestrated by the lord and they are orchestrated by the lord for our ultimate benefit krishna says maya dikshena prakriti everything happens under my supervision upadrashta anumanta cha it is i am the overseer at the same time krishna also says surdam sarvabhutanam i am the well wisher and this well wisher krishna is not saying i am the well wisher only of my devotees see the well wisher of everyone so the events that were happening in the world may seem chaotic may seem cruel but beyond such appearance of those events is is the omni benevolence of the lord and that is this is what we see here in the picture of prahlad there are people who are there are demons with scary forms and scary weapons out to attack him there are snakes out to attack him but he is just with his hands folded because he is not actually seeing them it is not that he is putting on an act of fearlessness sometimes we may be scared but we may act as if we are not scared for various reasons sometimes say that if if the parents may also be scared but if the children are with them then just the children should not become panicky so the parents may act as if they are not scared so and that is that is sometimes a part of our responsibility to conceal our emotions but prahlad is not doing like that he is actually feeling no fear why bhayam dvitiya abhinivita syasyat he is not seeing dvitiya he is not seeing anything separate from the lord so he's saying even if these weapons will pierce my body that is also the plan of the lord and therefore because the plan of the lord is always auspicious i have nothing to fear so just as whether the lord manifests as narasimha dev or he manifests as krishna whether he appears very uh, scary and angry or whether he ap- appears very loving and sweet in both cases he is the same lord he is having the same benevolent purpose and similarly through whatever events in our happening in our life none of us will ever be persecuted as much as prahlad has been persecuted 
but even if we feel that we are being terribly troubled still ultimately the lord is in control and the lord's plan is still operational at that time when prahlad was just resisting hiranyakashipu's uh, uh, atrocities tortures and assassination attempt assassination attempts prahlad could have felt painfully lonely because nobody was standing up to hiranyakashipu at that time even his own gurudev narad muni as a part of the leela was actually subordinating to hiranyakashipu so he could have felt terribly lonely he could have felt desolate deserted but he did not because he knew that the lord was within his heart and the lord was without whatever is happening was within the plan of the lord so now we may say how do i perceive it i am not at that level yes we are not but just intellectually first understanding this reality and then gradually tuning our consciousness to that reality that is what we can do by the practice of bhakti yoga so prahlad maharaj is the embodiment of smaranam of remembrance so remembrance of the lord is not just an intellectual activity it is not that when we remember the lord it is that we are we are you know okay somebody asks okay what is the capital of uh, somalia what is the capital of xyz it is not that uh, it's not a factual remembrance it is more of a direction of the heart it is the tuning of consciousness it is a that remembrance is an expression of love mm-hmm. it's like if somebody whom we love is far away then we may pick up their photo and remember them so what happens is when we tune our consciousness to krishna when we remember krishna what does it mean by the practice of bhakti yoga we understand that krishna is the supreme reality and he becomes the supreme reality the foremost reality in our consciousness so krishna is always the supreme reality but is he the supreme reality in our consciousness now for us when we are functioning there are okay you know this person is speaking like this oh this war is going on in this part of the world this political unrest is there over here this financial insecurity is there those may be the foremost realities now they are also realities that we have to deal with but for a devotee the more we practice bhakti yoga these realities become subordinate they are realities i have to deal with but the foremost reality is krishna is in control and shri prabhupad came to america you know he could have seen oh i am a old person i have no money i don't know anyone and these people have never heard of krishna how am i going to speak to them how am i going to understand what is even the use of my coming here but he what did prabhupad see prabhupad saw that actually krishna is still in control tomara ichcha hai sab ho hai maya vash tomara ichcha hai nash maya ra parash he saw that krishna you are still in control it is by your, under your arrangement that people all these people are under illusion and if you so desire they can come out of illusion and then he says if you wish to make me an instrument to bring them out of illusion please do so nachao nachao prabhu nachao se mate kashtere putli jata nachao se mate so prabhupada was not only not seeing the world as separate from krishna the american american coastline that he was seeing he was not seeing that separate from krishna he was not seeing himself as separate from krishna he saw that i am your instrument krishna I'm, if you want me to make me dance make me dance so our circumstances may be devotionally favorable or unfavorable but if you practice bhakti yoga then krishna will become the foremost reality in our consciousness and that is the purpose of turning our consciousness toward krishna and tuning our consciousness to krishna so we consciously turn our consciousness by practicing bhakti we take darshan of the lord we chant the holy names but that turning is we can't do that constantly because we can't be focused on krishna constantly but through the turning our consciousness conscious conscientiously for some time of sadhana of seva of swadhyay of satsang by that 
slowly our consciousness will become tuned to Krishna. And when it is tuned to Krishna, then even when we are not seeing Krishna, even when we are doing our family responsibilities, our professional responsibilities, our social responsibilities, we will be able to see the hand of Krishna. That's how by turning our consciousness to Krishna consciously, our consciousness will also become subtly tuned toward Krishna. And this, this point of favorable and unfavorable example, unfavorable externals, let's conclude with that. That if you consider the Bhagavatam is a book about death and departure from the world. Hmm? Now there are two contrasting departures. In the fourth canto, Dhruva's departure is described and it is said that he ascended the Vaikuntha plane and everybody could see it beautifully. And not only did he go with the Vishnu Dutas respecting him and he took his mother with him in a separate airplane. So, so it was supremely auspicious. So it appeared wonderful and it was wonderful. In contrast, if you consider Parikshit's departure, what happened was the Taksha, he was cursed to die and the Takshaka bird came and bit him. And when the Takshaka bird bit him, what happened? His whole body erupted into flames. And he, he, is, he, he died in that sense. So now, there are various ways of dying. Actually, burning to death is among the most painful forms of death. Uh, if somebody is shot with a bullet or cut with a knife, it's just one moment, the cut and it's death. But burning means you can actually, the whole skin all over the body there's not just one fatal wound, but there is pain all over the body. It's, it's among the most painful forms of death. So Parikshit's death can appear dreadful, but it was not dreadful. It was wonderful. It was just as wonderful as Dhruva's death, Dhruva's departure from the world. Why? Because by his Sharavanam, by his hearing, by his immersion in the practice of Bhakti Yoga, Parikshit Maharaj's consciousness was already with Krishna. And it was only his body he was burned, but his consciousness was no longer in his body. So materially, one departure was wonderful. Materially, the other departure was dreadful. But in both, the Lord was acting benevolently. The magic of bhakti was working. And so similarly for us, that sometimes our situations may be favorable, sometimes our situations may be unfavorable, but we can tune our consciousness to the Lord, focus on the Lord, that whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. What, whatever situations come in our life, you know, good or bad, that is our, our own karma coming upon us. Whatever karma may get us to, can have that faith that Krishna will get us through. Krishna is our all-loving Lord. He's our all-benevolent Lord. And He has sustained us for multiple lifetimes when we were not even inclined to turn towards Him. When we probably didn't even know about Him. So if He has sustained us through all those lifetimes, now that we have turned our consciousness towards Him, now that we are practicing bhakti, why will he not sustain us now? He will surely take us all the way. He has not brought us so far to abandon us now. So we may sometimes feel abandoned as Prahlad could have felt abandoned when he was all alone resisting the atrocities of Hiranyakashipu. But rather than giving in to those feelings, we can try to raise our consciousness and try to focus it on the Lord. So on the occasion of Narasimha Chaturdashi, let us all pray that just as Lord Narasimha Dev appeared as the foremost reality in the court of Hiranyakashipu, where Hiranyakashipu thought I was the king, he saw that oh, Lord Narasimha Dev still reigns supreme. So just as the Lord appeared there, uh, dwarfing all other realities and revealing himself as a supreme reality, may that Lord appear in, in our hearts as the supreme reality and all our cravings, all our fears, all our distractions, may they all become dwarfed by the Lord's supreme and supremely benevolent 
presence in our hearts that will be the fulfillment of the celebration of narasimha chaturdashi when the lord appears in our hearts and reigns supreme residing and presiding on the throne of our heart shri narasimha dev bhagwan ki jai so thank you very much i'll quickly summarize i discuss four main points i started by describing the fearsome form of lord narasimha dev and how this seems to be very different from the second point was the discontrast between krishna's and narasimha dev's form and why it is because of the purpose being different the third was the similarity between narasimha dev and vishwarup's form because their purpose was similar and the last was just as the lord may appear in different forms but he has one ultimate purpose even his anger expresses his love so similarly through the events in our life the lord is acting and he has a benevolent purpose so by tuning our consciousness to him we can make him the foremost reality and then whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through thank you very much hare krishna hey guruji can you hear us श्री नरसिम्ह देव भगवान की जय श्री प्रहलाद महाराज की श्री नरसिम्ह चतुर्दशी महामहोत्सव की जय श्री प्रभुपाद की जय गौरक्तवृंद की जय जय गौर प्रेमानंदे थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू शेयर समथिंग अबाउट लॉर्ड नरसिम्ह देवस ग्लोरीज हरे कृष्णा Can you hear me, Prabhu? Hello. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Can you hear us? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. No, Prabhu, I cannot hear you somehow. Strangely, let me see. Can you speak something now? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Ah, uh, Hare Krishna, Jai Shri Ram, Prabhu. Humble obeisances. Yes. Somehow I'm. Not... Yeah, please. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes, yes. So I will. Is it okay if we ask the devotees if they have questions to um, speak them out loud? Uh, we have time to take some questions. Yes, bro. I'm of service. I don't want to extend your time too much. But see, I'm not able to hear you on Zoom. Somehow, I'll see if I can fix it. But maybe then you can repeat the question on the phone if possible okay. sure hare krishna yeah you can hear me Hare Krishna. So, is it a real story or is it a? Is that the question? Prabhu is asking whether the story that we heard. 
Is it a real story or a mythological story? Okay. So, is it a real or a mythological story? Well, there are two things over here. First of all, just this categorization itself is, uh, to some extent, uh, artificial uh, categorization based on a uh, non-Vedic framework of thinking. That we, if we consider this, it is in the Western post-Newtonian way of approaching reality, uh, reality is seen as fact-centered. Hmm? Whereas, if we consider even in the Western world, before, uh, before uh, the age of what we call a scientific revolution, even the histories that are written, hmm, whether it is Shakespeare writing or whether the Iliad, Odyssey, whatever books are written, the purpose of history is not facts, but values. That we study what has happened in the past to learn values from it. So the facts are, it's not that the facts are not there or not important, but the facts are not the primary thing. So, so this, when we talk about real or mythological, the idea is real means it's based on facts and mythological means, okay, there are some values to be learned from it, but it's not real. No, the Vedic understanding is that there is real history, but the focus is not on the facts of history. The focus is on the values learned from history. Now, uh, to go beyond to specifically, the question is, is this something that really happened? Yes. The universe is far, far more complex than what our senses can perceive. And even what our technologically extended sense of cognition, whether it is through the universe in space or in the past history, what we can perceive that is limited. So beyond what we can perceive, there are many things in the universe. And yes, the Lord can appear in extraordinary forms and the Lord can do extraordinary deeds. So these are not, so the, say the Lord Narasimha Dev appearing through a pillar and breaking himself up, having a giant form. Now all this is not unscientific. Uh, divine activities are not against science. They are above science. They are, science expresses God's will in terms of how he has ordered the universe to function in normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. So whether it is Newton's laws of motion or electromagnetic uh, laws of electromagnetism or whatever, they also express God's will of how nature functions normally. But sometimes by divine will, for special situations, the normal way of functioning is suspended. And sometimes the Lord does extraordinary things. So both the ordinary course of things happening in nature and the extraordinary things that happen when the Lord appears, both a devotee sees as expressing God's, uh, God's supremacy through the order of the universe and through the through susp temporary suspension of that order. So yes, these are historical events, but these are not just ordinary historical events. We can say this is transcendence manifesting through history. Normal, normal history is operating within the constraints of space and time and the laws of physics. But when the Lord appears within history, at that time, those constraints of time and space of the laws of physics are suspended. So when Krishna say lifts the Govardhan hill, Somebody may ask, you know, how can somebody, one person lift a big mountain? And even if you lift the mountain, so even if I have to lift my phone on the little finger, it's difficult. And how can I have to first of all find the exact center of gravity to be able to lift up Govardhan, uh, to lift up uh, this uh, phone also and balance it. So if somebody asks, how could Krishna have lifted up the Govardhan? How did he heavy, lift such a heavy weight? How did he find the center of gravity? How did he resist its weight? So actually Krishna doesn't have to find the center of gravity because he is the source of gravity. So gravity acts under his rule, under his will, and he can suspend it temporarily. So yes, even if these some of the events seem supernatural, uh, they, they seem miraculous, but that doesn't mean that they are fictional. 
So we can use the word mythological in the sense that they, the focus is on values. That is true. But if you're saying mythological in the sense that it is fictional, no, it's not fictional. They are fantastic, but they are not fantasy. Fantasy means their imagination. Fantastic means they involve things which is difficult for us to understand, which are difficult for us to perceive. But that doesn't mean that they are fictional. Okay. Any other questions? There's uh, another question. How can a devotee who is surrounded by the, the, the wrongdoing or the evil not feel succumb to follow to keep on uh, I guess following Krishna or devotee even around uh, wrongdoing? Like a practical example. Prabhuji, did you hear that one? No, can you please repeat? So Prabhuji asked if one is surrounded by wrongdoing or evil, then how can one remain Krishna focused in spite of what's going on in their surroundings? That okay. So a, we are sur surrounded by wrongdoing in our surroundings, and how can we stay Krishna focused? Yes, it is difficult. So two things. First is that uh, we need to choose our battles. If we consider three modes of material nature. In Tamoguna, we underestimate our capacity to, uh, to do anything. There's nothing I can do about it. In Rajoguna, we, over, we overestimate our capacity. We think that no, I can fix all problems. In Sattvaguna, we can we learn to estimate our capacity properly. I can't change everything, but maybe I can make some small changes. Maybe I can make a contribution. So sometimes the world may be so, uh, so things may be so terribly wrong that we may not even feel that we can make any difference. Hmm? But even if we can't make a difference, we can still make a contribution to some cause that will make a difference. So each of us, we can't do much to change the consciousness of the world. But there are many things are unfavorable. But maybe what we can do is try to keep our consciousness as high as possible, not let it sink into lower modes, not let it get consumed by lower desires. So understanding what is in our capacity to do, that is important. And we can't, we, we can't change the world. We can't also change the world from affecting our consciousness because we have to function in the world. But we can make some time regularly for protecting and purifying our consciousness. So if we do, if we invest some time for connecting directly with Krishna, that will help us to uh, stay uh, to protect our consciousness. And then maybe we can also make a difference or make a contribution towards making a difference. So for doing this, for protecting and purifying our consciousness, we can firstly invest some time in spiritual practices. And then secondly, we know in our circumstances, those things which especially agitate our consciousness, which especially trouble us, which especially tempt us, whatever, we try to keep a distance from them. And in the things which uplift our consciousness, we try to we try to connect more with them. So even if we are in a professional setting or say where everybody seems to be materialistic, but you know, just material, materialistic is a very broad word. Even among people who are materially minded, there'll be some people who are relatively in Sattva Guna. And we say, no, everybody has terrible habits and they're in Tamaguna. Well, don't just look at particular habits, look at overall behavior. 
but there are people who are contemplative there are people who think about some higher purposes in life not everybody is simply pursuing gross sensuality 24 hours a day so even in our association we can try to avoid those influences which are especially uh, tamasic which are especially degrading and whatever circumstances we have if there is some level of like mindedness some some level of sattva is there we can highlight that so that way you, so one is we withdraw from the external association to connect with krishna directly and when we are in that external association we try to focus more on sattva as much as possible and we try to minimize the exposure to tamas so like prahlad maharaj what he did was he was a small child now he couldn't change what his guru what is shanda and amarka were teaching hmm? so he heard them he was not a rebellious student who was uh, disrupting their classes when they were teaching but after their class was over when he was with his friends now he focus uh, it was other co students he started speaking about krishna to them now is it that every single child of every demon started becoming equally receptive to bhakti maybe not but he created that space for himself even in that association where he could be krishna conscious and he could share krishna consciousness now if we can't share krishna consciousness at least we can share some sattva guni values and have some higher consciousness okay yeah follow up for Yes, yeah, good. Anybody else would like to ask questions for Prabhuji? Prabhuji, I think that's what I heard. You know, I think uh, no further questions. Any further questions? Okay, so thank you very much for taking it down and allowing us to. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Hare Krishna. Shri Narasimha Dev Bhagwan Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Hare Bhagwan. Shri Narasimha Dev Bhagwan Ki Jai.